Okay, today is July 30th, 2006. I am Jessica Clark. It is a pleasure to conduct this interview for the Dakota Memories Oral History Project in Regina, Saskatchewan, in Canada. Um, to start with, can you state your full name? My full name is Leo Peter Heroff. And where were you born, Leo? I was born actually on a farm uh, close to Davin, Saskatchewan. Where? Davin. Davin, okay. Yeah. And when were you born? The 19th of January, 1931. Have you ever heard a story about your birth? Not really. My sisters did tell me they were chased out of the house and sent to school so they, uh, so they wouldn't be around for the whole thing. How many sisters, older sisters, do you have? I have uh, four. I had four older sisters. Uh, let me think. Uh, five older sisters. Five. Five. Yeah, but they're not all older. I had uh, uh, one died. That's why I'm thinking here. And uh, there's three older sisters and two younger. Okay. Yeah. Um. Can you share with us some of your earliest childhood memories? Yeah, I can remember way back uh, when I was uh, probably four or five years old. Uh, I remember things like uh, being chased by a rooster. Not very nice. Uh, I had to, uh, this is going to be maybe a little bit dicey, but I had to go to the bathroom, and you know, in those days, you were in the out went to the outhouse, eh? And uh, of course, the hole was pretty big, and I was only a little guy, and I was afraid I'd fall down into the hole, so I went behind the outhouse, which was by the outhouse, and I thought, well, I'll do my thing, and I just was ready to uh, to do what I had to do, and uh, this big rooster comes after me. Well, that was quite a scramble. I don't remember how it ended up. I know I didn't uh, do what I had to do. <laughs> I can remember uh, my dad digging a well by hand uh, uh, on the farm, actually, where Ben Ferner uh, got to live. I was uh, raised there for about three years. That was our uncle's farm. And... Uh, I can remember him digging a well by hand with, uh, with uh, going down the well without any cribbing around and uh, digging it out with a spade and putting it in a pail and uh, heaving it up with a pail on, uh, on, with a rope. And, uh, and the older brother and sisters, they threw it on the side and sent him the pail back down. He found a bit of water, but never enough. I mean, it was hard to find water there. That, that I remember. I remember old cars and things like that. and. Uh, I remember uh, going into uh, what they called the 14 Colony, where my grandfather lived. Uh, one Sunday, coming after church and uh, being behind our uncle, and he was driving a McLaughlin Buick with a cloth top on it, and that dog, uh, that uh, that uh, colony was full of dogs. Eh? Well, till he got to the end of the colony, he was sitting there as proud as a peacock driving his car, there was no more top left. They tore the whole top off the car. But they didn't bother the people. They just didn't like the rattle of the of the of the the wind hitting the the roof, eh? Those are little things I remember. Uh, I can remember the dry thirties uh, when uh when uh things were so bad that it stormed every day, the sun you couldn't see the sun. And uh my dad going out and uh, taking off the crop and putting it on from uh, 80 acres all on two hay racks and then hauling it six miles to try and get it thrashed, which there was nothing in it, you know. Then paying my uncle to uh, kind of have an agreement with him. He took so much grain and dad got so much, so he didn't get much out of it. Not enough of the chickens, that's for sure. But anyway, that was, that was bad times. I like to tend to remember the good times. I can remember my sister. Uh, at all in that age, uh, when it was so dry, it started to rain a little bit, and it never rained much, just like you saw when you were here now. Maybe get a little bit of a drizzle, and uh, and then it was gone. Well, it came down, was hitting the window pretty good, and we were up in the in the 
second story of the house and I don't know we were probably playing up there and it started raining and we had a veranda on the side and my sister looked down and she thought it was raining so hard she wanted to see if the potatoes were uh, were drowning you know so she was right by the window and I was only probably four years old and uh, had a little mischief in me I guess and I gave her a push and she ended up with her uh, through the window hey and she still got the scar to show for it, and she reminds me of it once in a while, you know. That. <laughs> but it was, it all come out okay. We had a little game we played in that same house. Uh, you know, those old two-story houses, you went up one flight. Then you had to go around a corner, and you went up a second flight to get to the next story. Well, we developed a game, my sister, my brother, and I. I was the youngest. And we had a sponge ball. That's one of the toys we had. It was a sponge ball or a bat or something, but we were uh, indoors in the wintertime and, you know, it was a big house with central heating and and on the end of the wall there was a big mirror hanging up on the wall, a length, a lengthy, a lengthy mirror. And this game uh, went like this. One guy sat two stairs up from the bottom approximately the other guy sat at the corner, and the other person was up on top of the stairs throwing the ball. Now, the idea was to bounce it off the one head and onto the other, and uh, then you got a score, eh? Well, it was my turn, and I, I threw it, and I bounced it off the first one and missed the second and went right through the mirror, okay? Well, that's seven years' bad luck, you know? And more bad luck than that for me, because my dad wasn't very, very, uh, uh, how would you put it? Uh, not, uh, uh, didn't see it my way. Eh? He was a little rough. Those old Germans were pretty serious. Well, yeah, the strap come out, but he didn't get me. I, he was gone to town. He wasn't there, so I got under the bed. In those days, they had a spring mattress, and I got under there, and I hung on to that spring mattress with my toes and my fingers, eh? Well, he tried to get me out, he couldn't get me out, and then all of a sudden he started to laugh because I was only four years old and he couldn't handle me. Well, I knew then I could come out, it was pretty safe, you know. <coughs> Didn't get it that day. <laughs> As we grew up, we, uh, they always had a, a little bit of a feeling for the place that my grandpa my, on my dad's side had bought for him uh, and uh, they had a Christmas concert one year over at that it was six miles away and we had a 28 Chev uh, Chevy car and uh, it would have been just as fast to drive a team of horses over I guess but he wanted to drive over with the car so he spent all afternoon and morning shoveling snow there was no uh, snowblower Shoveling snow, and by the time night came, it started to storm, and we never did get out of the yard. <laughs> oh, that was quite a deal. And after that, we moved out of there, and we moved over to the other. Uh, ben Furners and, and their family moved into that home, and we moved over to uh, where we now have our, our farm. Uh, there's been many instances. I can uh, recall playing a game called uh, darts. We made our darts out of a piece of broomstick, about that long, and then you uh, sharpen the nail real sharp with a file, and you put it in the end, and made it about that long, and uh, on the other hand, you made three holes and got a hold of the rooster and pulled three feathers out of his tail. If you had a, a turkey, it was better because you had bigger feathers, eh? <coughs> but the poor rooster, you know how he was, by the time the end of the day was, still everybody had a dart. Didn't look very good. But we started playing, and uh, my neighbors, uh, we were always together with our neighbors there. The two boys come down, and we made a dartboard with chalk on the on the wall of the old garage. <coughs> and we started throwing. One guy, now it's your turn, now it's your turn. I was ahead of the, my one cousin, and uh, I wasn't quick enough to get my dart out, and he got me. He put it right through there <laughs> and stuck my hand right on the wall. Well, I pulled a dart out and I went over to the well and I pumped water on it and my my folks never knew about that either. I dare not tell them, hey. 
I can remember every Christmas, for some reason or another, my dad would always get me a a cap gun. I don't know why, but and uh, this garage we had on that farm, it was an old garage. It had a car that could get in the center, and the other end was a chicken house. And on the other end was a kind of a workshop with a bunch of, uh, there I go, put my hands out, another uh, bunch of junk in it, and you had a hole in the one end and a hole in the other. Uh, to get up in the loft, eh? So, uh, my dad got me this cap gun for Christmas, and there's no place to use it, so I went out in the chicken house, eh? With this cap gun, well, there was no eggs from the chickens for two weeks. I don't know if they ever found out or not, but I never, they couldn't have, or else I'd have got a licking. And the same place when I, well, we went to school and we had a game, at that time we called it, uh, Run, sheep, run. I don't know if you've ever heard that game or not. I've heard the name, but I don't know what it is. Well, you form two sides, and it's a competition. You have to hide and no further than half a mile from the school, eh? So then you'd go and hide. The other guys would stay in the school and not look where you hide, wherever. And uh, then they'd send back uh, one person to draw a map on the wall, on the, on the, on the uh, blackboard, and... Uh, Designate approximately where it was. Well, it never showed the place anyway, because you may as well go and look on your own, because nobody would tell you where they're hiding, you know. But anyway, that's that's how it was. So this uh, this garage of ours was a prime target, and you know you'd go up in the loft of that place, and everybody would look, would look there first day. So I happened to be up there the one day, and. Uh, and there was always, there was only one way up, and uh, you could jump down the other side, eh? But you had to go through the chicken house, you know, to, to get up into the loft. And, of course, as soon as the chickens started making a noise, I knew somebody was coming, and it's time to leave, eh? Because if you got back, you got points, you know, the team would get points. And Well, I jumped down, and uh, lo and behold, I jumped down, and there was two boards under the, <laughs> a nail in each board, eh? You can imagine. Nobody knew about that either. I, you know, and it's funny, you don't get blood poisoning or nothing in those days. The uh, nails weren't any cleaner than they are today, you know. But there was no uh, penicillin or nothing. I don't know if you want to hear any more of that or not. But no, this is great. Yeah? This is great. We used to, in the spring of the year, we had a dam. We built it by hand uh, with the uh, help of the PFRA. They paid us to make it. And, we made it with a four-horse Fresno, which is a scraper, you know what that is? And you'd scrape the ground, and you'd dump it, and you made a whole wall across. You can imagine how long that took. Well, you got paid by the day, I guess, maybe $2 a day or something, and you didn't care how many days you worked because you got paid, eh? But uh, we finally completed it, and it was nice. It was a half mile of water. And uh, then the trouble started over the spillway. The water, it came so fast that over the years it would start washing it out, eh? So we wanted to save this dam, so my brother and I, we were elected more or less to dig a trench across, and then we put cement in our cement wall in the spillway. And uh, the doggone thing, the water went through the bottom and washed the cement away, you know? It's, it's got a lot of power. But this dam has served more than that purpose. It served uh, the purpose of uh, getting us some water for us kids at school. Like every noon hour, we could leave the schoolyard, which was nice. Our home was right across from the school, so they were allowed to come over into our uh, pasture and whatever, or go skating. Or But uh, every spring, when the spring first appeared, we'd go drowning out gophers, eh? So we had water in a lot of water, and of course that was a riot, you know, you'd each have a pail. You'd spill enough in, maybe two buckets full, and a gopher would come out, you know, and you'd have three, four guys standing around with sticks or bats or something, and what a mess, you know. <laughs> oh, dear. So were gophers like a pretty big menace at that time? Oh, they're, they're the same as, oh yeah, they're, they never change. They've always been that way. We used that hill also for uh, sliding. Uh, we each made ourselves uh, a one one runner sleigh. If you've ever heard of them or not, the, the the skid was about that long, 
and it's a width of a two by four, you know, made like a runner. And you'd have one board on top about that wide and maybe that long. Now, you take a run with that in your hands, okay? And you have actually competitions with that thing. And you'd take a run with your hands and you'd end up with it on your, with your chest on it, eh? And you'd go down that hill to beat the band, you know? The one guy would always win because he had the secret. He put uh, some uh, copper or brass, I believe it was, on the bottom of his, uh, for uh, like for, uh, and ours were only, we didn't even put steel on. They were wood, eh? So that uh, brass would slip better on the snow. And geez, he'd go like a blaze. We could never catch him, eh? You yeah. mentioned that uh, some of the kids would come over to your place and go skating. Oh yeah. Were they home? Did you have homemade skates or were they store bought? Oh, they were bought. They were bought. Yeah. Uh, they were different skates than they are today. We started off with uh, some that were only uh, uh, the bottom part of the skate, and you strap them to your shoe. Okay? And then we progressed up. We were able to get some that other guys uh, had used, uh, like hand me downs. Uh, they weren't, uh, we couldn't afford to buy new ones, nobody could at that time, so you pretty well looked at uh, Boy Scouts or second hand stores or whatever there was and got used ones. And then you'd get some, uh, if you were fortunate, you got some uh, that, that were big enough and some were too big, so you put two, three pairs of socks and a pair of socks in the front if they had to, and just anything to get on the ice. Eh? I can remember when I got my first skates, I, we went down to our neighbor's place. We didn't have uh, the water at that time, and uh, we went down with a car, and uh, we were on top of the hill, and I put the skates on in the car, and I got out and I went down the hill, and uh, lo and behold, I thought I would skate, and <laughs> I hit the ice, and so did my head. The back of my head got right now, eh? So that was a good awakening. Then I learned how to skate, you know? You don't know how to skate when you put skates on. I found that much out. So when you were growing up, you, you've talked a little bit about some, some minor injuries. Were you ever seriously hurt when you were a kid? <coughs> well, I had probably, I can't remember it, but they tell me, and I guess it's documented, but anyway, I ended up in the hospital when I was three, four years old with spinal meningitis. And that, at that time, was a, and still is probably a very serious ailment. And I ended up in the hospital. I could walk when I went in, couldn't walk when I come out. And uh, I understand, uh, I can't tell you if this is, I get it from a pretty good source that I had a spinal tap at that time to get the liquid off, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. So I've lived uh, 71 years longer than uh, probably or 70, maybe two, because I can remember when I was four, or I certainly remember that. <coughs> Other than that, I, uh, I spent uh, six weeks in the hospital once from playing baseball with uh, blood poisoning, uh, which was very serious at that time. I got uh, injured on the heel of my foot where there's no meat, and uh, it didn't want to heal because it was growing into the bone. And uh, they got it, though. They cured it. Thank God for penicillin. How old were you when that happened? Uh, 17. I used to uh, play a lot of baseball. I, I went to uh, camping college in Regina, finished high school in Regina at a Jesuit uh, boarding school. And they insisted that you play sports, and uh, you fell in love with baseball. That was one thing. What position did you play? Third base. A hot spot. So, um, with with the team that you played, did you have um, like uniforms? And oh yeah. Did you have to buy those uniforms or? At uh, no, at high school they were supplied supplied by the uh, by the school. We had uh, we had uh, players from a lot of different uh, parts of the world. Let's put it this way: uh, our first baseman was a guy from. Uh, uh, Jose Moreira, he was from uh, from Honduras. We had uh, another guy was from Mexico. Then we had kids from all over Saskatchewan and all over Canada, type of thing. So we had a big area. And this, while I'm on it, we had a lot of kids from uh, from Mexico went to school there at that time. About eight of them, and. Uh, 
I can remember these two young kids, uh, the first snowfall. You know what snow is, right? And what you can't do is snow. Well, these kids thought they could put it in an envelope and send it home, eh? So they were so happy with this, they went out in the snow and they were playing in the snow and they grabbed some put it in the envelope and, and sent it home, eh? Well, I think they had to explain it when they got home what wasn't there, eh? <laughs> that was funny. Camping college. Camping college? Yeah. And how old were you when you were attending that? I, uh, I was uh, 15, I was uh, 16 and 17. I took grade 11 and 12 there. Grade 9 and 10 I took my uh, correspondence in a public school, just at home, which wasn't the best thing. I should have gone to uh, uh, high school right away when I was in grade 9. It would have been better. We had no high schools out there, nowhere. You got to go to Regina or, or some bigger center. There were none in any towns, eh? So when you were growing up, were you the only boy in your family? No, I had an older brother okay. and a younger brother. Did they all get an education or were you the first? Uh, yeah, my older brother was sent away to, uh, to a boarding school at Munster, Saskatchewan. And he didn't finish. He finished grade 11, I think, and then he quit. And my younger brother, uh, they had moved to Regina when we got married, and they moved to Regina, and he f finished his uh, high school at Camping College as well. And he entered the seminary, and he was actually a Jesuit priest for a number of years. So then uh, the love bug hit him, and he wanted to have a wife, and uh, he left, and now he's got two beautiful kids. Good for him. That's what life's all about. So when you were playing on this, this baseball team for the high school, would you have away games where you would go and oh, travel yeah. somewhere? What was that like? Yeah, well, I, very good. We had a real good team. We, uh, we went with that team one year uh, to a sports day down in Gravelberg, Saskatchewan, which is 100 miles away on the back of a flat truck. The whole team was on the back of this flat truck. And... Uh, this school was very, very strict. Uh, you know, you you could go out if you told them you were not going to be back for dinner. But if you didn't tell them you weren't going to be back for dinner, you better be there because they were very disciplinary. And we took this whole team the one year to a sports day in Vibank. It was on during our school term. Went to Vibank, uh, the whole team, and uh, a number of us, well, we were all bored, act we called ourselves boarders, eh? we were live-ins. And we didn't sign out for supper and we didn't make it back for supper because we were in the finals in Bybank. We got back and well, there was a lot of discipline. He got out the strap and we all got the strap in grade 12. Yeah, there was no, uh, there was no sparing the rod in those days. <laughs> for a little bit sure. and talk about your family sure. history. On your dad's side, did you know your grandparents? I I knew them, but I didn't know them real well because, of course, I was only, I don't know, maybe five or six years old when my grandpa died. What was your grandpa's name? Peter. And what was your grandma's name? He had, uh, he had, uh, he was married and then his uh, first wife died and he married again, I think her name. What was it, Catherine and Phyllis? I, I'm not sure. I'd have to get out the book. Okay. Um, you, your grandpa, Peter, you said he, you were about five when he died? Yeah, in there some, five, six years old. Do you remember anything about him? Yeah, I can remember. He was a chain smoker. He, uh, he didn't smoke uh, out of a can either. He had leaves that he got from the from the tobacco growers in Ontario. And he'd sit at his table, always at the end of the table, always in one spot. And he'd be chopping his tobacco and, uh, and be smoking. Then he'd have to quit for a while. Before that cigarette was gone, he'd have another one rolled to start it from the other one. He just smoked that heavy. <coughs> My grandmother, she uh, used to bake the, she used to bake the, some of the best bread we used to stop there before we, uh, well, after church, I guess. 
and she'd always have some sugar bread for us. She got out the big bread and she cut her about two inches thick and put sugar on it instead of butter. Well, that was good. Did your um, grandparents come over from Russia to Canada? Uh, from the Ukraine and that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did they go through the States or did they come straight to Canada? Oh, they came to Canada. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember about when that was? Or, I mean, do you know when that was? It was the end of the 1800s. 1800s? Okay. Yeah. My, uh, there actually were two brothers came over. One ended up in the States. They come, come over at the same time. Now, I can't tell you if he went through the States or not, but uh, we've never made too much contact with them. We had a family reunion and some of them were up, but other than that, we haven't really, and it's not that far away, you know. Of course, that's third and ninth parallel, you know. It's... So how many children did your grandparents have? You know? Joe, Mike, Anton, Simon, Jake. Six. Six. All boys? One girl. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see. Do you remember when your grandfather died? Do you have any memories of his funeral? Yeah, I can remember him in the coffin and them putting him down. I don't know what he died of. Nobody told us as kids. All we knew is Grandpa wouldn't be there anymore. He was uh, he was uh, eighty some years old, so okay. you chalked it up to old age at that time. That's extremely old yeah. at that time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I looked up when guys were fifty years old. I figured they were ready to one foot in the grave, eh? Mm-hmm. How about your mom's parents? Did you know them? Yeah, I knew them both too. Yeah. What was uh, what were their names? Uh, Uncle Joe. Our uh, grandpa's name was Joe, and her name, I'm not sure, what did Ben Furner tell you his grandmother's name was? <laughs> we had the same yeah, grandparents. Okay. We had the same grandparents. You know, I never, never thought even to look, I mean, you know. I remember my grandmother better than my grandfather because uh, she lived a little longer than she did than he did, and I was a little older when she passed away. But she was always very kind and very. She lived with my uncle Leo Fallman, and uh, that lady would always have coffee on. If you came there, she always had coffee, and she never cleaned the pot out. She made it from from grounds, and she'd always add some new grounds. I don't know when she ever dumped the grounds out, but she must have at some time. But I'd see her making coffee and putting new grounds in, never taking the coffee out, and making it on a wood stove, eh? Pretty good coffee, even for a young guy. So how old were you when you started drinking coffee? Uh, not, I never drank coffee seriously until I was probably in my early teens. And my grandmother, I can remember about her too. She was a very tiny lady on my, on my mother's side. She was only probably 80, 85 pounds and just, uh, well, I don't think she was five feet tall. She was a pretty small girl. But boy, she was sure a wonderful woman. You don't have to be big to be wonderful, do you? So how often would you get to visit with her? We were over there just about every week, okay. yeah, every, pretty near every Sunday. Where did she live in relation to your farm? Uh, they were five miles uh, from our farm. There was two colonies close together there. Uh, it would have been nice if you would have been able to see them. Oh, we went out there. Did you? Yeah, Chris, Chris, okay. Chris took us out, Christina. Oh, yeah. Smart took us out yeah. there to St. Peter's and... Well, that's where my grandparents lived. Uh, the Harrofs lived in the St. Peter's, and my grandmother lived in the other one, which was uh, 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 Catherine Tall. Okay, yep, I've been to both of them. So. Yep. So you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. Well, and where I grew up, when I, I started school, actually, over in Catherine Tall, 
I went there for about three months before we moved over to the other place. And the farm was just to the south of there, of Cathenthal, where I where I was brought up as a young person. You said you um, you uh, you even remember your grandfather, just not as well on your mom's side. What was he like? What do you remember about him? I was. He never bothered me because I never made any trouble, I guess. <laughs> you know, the, the old people in those days, you, you kept your nose clean, you know. They could be pretty strict. I understand he was a heck of a shot. He, he was probably trained in the Russian army because I understand he could pick a goose out of the sky with a, with a high-powered rifle. That's one of the stories that maybe it's a tale, but uh, I wouldn't doubt it. You know? So when you were growing up, did you do any hunting? No, never had time for that. I was into the active sports. I've never fished. I've never hunted, except for gophers. I hunt them pretty regularly. <laughs> so how old were you when those grandparents passed away? They passed away. My grandfather, grandfather, he passed away probably when I was around the same time my grandfather Harold did, not much later than that. And my grandmother passed away probably five, six years after that, <coughs> which would make me maybe 10, 11 years old. Do you remember their funerals? Yeah, just uh, more or less the caskets. Uh, all the funerals to me were nearly the same. They were very sad and and very uh, everybody crying and moaning and groaning. And today they are a little more, you know, you're going to heaven and you should be happy that you're gone, type of thing. You wear you wear louder clothes and. <laughs> children did your grandparents on that side have? On, on, uh, on the side. There was an awful lot of them. They, uh, they went through a very bad time. They went through that, uh, that, uh, that, that flu epidemic they had in the, in the 30s. And they lost, I think, uh, as many as two, three kids in one day. So that must, uh, you know, I can imagine what, uh, that was like to go through. I think she lost something like seven brothers and sisters, and uh, it was a large family. I'd say 14 to 16, uh, but they weren't all alive. Okay. See, when you would talk to your grandparents, did you speak English or German? German. I couldn't speak hardly any English before I started school. All our training was in German, and our uh, religious training was in German, because <coughs> our priest made pretty sure of that. He was a, a strict, strict German. Well, actually, a French German. So the community you grew up in then was was German and French, or was it just German and English, actually? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> And it was uh, it was not like today. You live in harmony, but those were those were rough days. Those days, I can remember a lot of religious uh, problems that when I was a kid, growing up, religion always was at the bottom of it. So was it a Catholic community or mixed? Even it was mixed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And we went to uh, we were uh, invited to go, but anyway, we went to school in a in a Protestant school. And uh, as a result, uh, I think that's where a little bit of the friction was with the older people. Eh? The kids didn't care. What do you care about that? Eh? And thank God it's changed. So when you were going to school, you, since you went to a Protestant school or a mixed school, would there be any religious instruction in school? No, or? no. 
No, we we sang the Lord's we said the Lord's Prayer every day before before uh, school started. That's about the extent of it because they, you couldn't do that. Did you do that all through school? You would say it before school. I mean. Yep. Well, when I got into high school, it was more pronounced than that. You you had a lot of religious instruction there. Is that because it was a Catholic? Yeah. Catholic? Yep. Um. Let's see here. Let's look at your parents for a little bit. Let's start with your dad. What was his name? Adam Joseph. And when you think back to your childhood, can you tell me what type of a father your dad was? He was hardworking. He did the best he could, a lot of times better than he should have, but he also was very strict, which wasn't bad. You, you learn to accept it, and as you grow older, you, you appreciate what it was all about. My dad was hardworking. I know when, uh, in, uh, when times were tough, he would take a, uh, a hay rack, if you know what that is, in the middle of winter time with a sleigh under it, and go six miles for a load of straw to feed the cows. Not only did he go the six miles, but when he got there, the straw pile was half blown over with snow, so he had to first shovel snow away from the outside of the straw pile, and then he had to take the straw and pitch it on top of the snow, and then he pitched it on the rack. To get one load of straw, it took him all day. So he was very, it was very demanding. So he was obviously a farmer. Oh yeah. He was also a musician. He, in his younger days before I uh, got to know, but my sisters could remember that he had a, a small band, a three-man band, and uh, he played dances. And uh, it used to dance used to have to be over at one o'clock, but then they'd get together and they'd each. Uh, Maybe they'd take another 25 cents or whatever, and they'd get him to pay another half hour or so. And by the time he got home, the sun was coming up, and of course he didn't get much rest. Eh? He never only went with a car. He had a horse that he rode to, to go to the dance. Six miles sometimes, and he'd put the uh, button accordion over his, uh, over his shoulder and jump on the horse. He never had a saddle. Eh? So takes a lot of fortitude. So what instruments did he play? Yeah, the button accordion. Did he ever play that for you when you were? Oh yeah, all the time. Oh yeah. I in fact uh, learned to play it a little bit myself. Really? But I didn't never, my brother got the accordion, I don't know where it ended up, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little different than a piano or something like that to play. You got two notes on one key sometimes. Uh, I don't know exactly how it works anymore, but you had a pull and push, and I think one key had different notes or whatever. So when you were um, when you were learning to play, were you teaching yourself, or was your dad teaching you? Or? No, you you kept watching them, and uh, well, I guess music. <coughs> It's strange with music. If you if you aren't musical, you can't learn it by yourself. You can you can be taught it probably, but uh, you were able to pick it up because you were musically inclined. Eh? So when you were growing up, would you say would you say you were close to your father? Yeah, we were more like brothers. When I got older, he was a lot different. He mellowed. What type of things would you do with your father when you were a, a young boy? That is a good question. We never fished. We never hunted. He probably uh, playing ball. He was a ball player. He liked playing ball. He was a first baseman. He never taught me much about ball, but we did play a little ball, uh, catching, what have you. And other than that, there's 
There weren't very many games that we played together. Cards, we played a lot of cards. What card games did you play? Uh, rummy, things like that, Just simple games. Until we got older, then we learned to play uh, team games like uh, 66 I, and uh, Whist. And never did play bridge with him, but uh, Pinochle used to like that game. When uh, you were growing up, did you ha ever have to help your father uh, on the in the fields? Oh yeah. What type of? Uh, oh yeah, I I was driving uh, uh, six horse uh, teams already when I was six seven years old. We uh, I can remember one day uh, he went to Regina. My older brother was supposed to uh, harrow a field, which was uh, about sixty acres, I guess. And my brother wouldn't do it, so I went out and <coughs> it was quite an ordeal. It was dark when I finished, and uh, I ended up coming home with a uh, with a uh, with a broken uh, pole on the front, and not very happy about it. But anyways, uh, I got the field done, and he didn't get licking. <laughs> and uh, another thing, they used to have a cart that you used to be able to ride behind to, with the horses uh, when you when you were with uh, with the harrows, six harrows, and then you had a cart. Well, we threw that cart away because you were back there sitting in the dust, and you can imagine how that was. So we'd stand on that. It was a four by four board that that you put all those harrows on, tied them on. Eh? You stand on there behind the horses, eh? And you'd go like that all day. Then you'd run across the board to the other side just to change positions. Or... It was a lot better than sitting back in the dust, I can tell you. <laughs> so what type of farmer was, was your dad? Was he a, a grain farmer or a dairy farmer? And... When I was young, he was a dairy. He had a dairy, yeah. He uh, had to milk the cows and get the milk to the to the train by seven o'clock in the morning. And where he had to load it on the train was five miles away from the farm. So you can imagine that took an hour to get just with. So he'd go with a two one horse and uh, it had two. Uh, they called it a buggy, little buggy. Eh? It had two rubber tire trailers on the side, rubber tires on the side, and the, uh, just one seat. So he'd sit and I'd get up in the seat. I don't know how he ever managed to get the cream cans up, but he had the cream cans, and he was uh, one arm around the cream cans, and he was driving the horse with, with the other. And away he'd go every day, never, never, never complain. But he could never, all the, you know, in those days you had to milk the cows by hand. And uh, my my dad could never milk a cow. He couldn't milk a cow to save his soul. I could milk probably four cows till he managed to get half a pail of milk. So uh, I don't know if he never could milk a cow if he was just smart enough not to learn. But he never stayed close to the milk barn when it was time to milk. He loved his chickens. He had his chickens and he stayed far away from the milk barn. We uh, we learned to milk. In fact, uh, when we moved back to the farm in 1953, we both worked in Regina before that. And when we moved back in 1953, uh, my dad had uh, more than one color cow. They all had calves that were being nursed on the cow. Well, we took the calves away from the cow and we started milking all these cows by hand. We milked as high as 21 cows uh, by hand, I and my wife and uh, carried the milk all into the house, down the basement, separated it by hand, carried it all back out and fed the pigs and the calves. And those were the days. But we progressed up from there. We progressed up and ended up, our sons were dairy farmers. They milked uh, 120 cows at one time. And uh, they had a fully automatic barn. And. Uh, I was sure sad to see the day when they quit. Just couldn't manage beside each other anymore. One got married, another guy got a woman that uh, the other guy didn't approve of, and uh, things got worse and worse, and finally it ended up at 
Solidary. But that's life, eh? So your mom, what was her name? Teresa. What type of a mother was she when you were growing up? She was strict, but not quite as strict as my dad. She was, uh, she uh, put on a strong face, but we all learned that she was pretty soft. She uh, nurtured pretty well. She taught me a lot of German. She, uh, my dad and her talked two different dialects of German. My dad was, uh, talked a, kind of a lower German. My mom was more toward the higher German that you learn out of the, out of the book. Mm -hmm. So when I took my German in high school, she was able to help me with a lot of my high school, although she probably only had, I forget, it wasn't even a year of schooling. My mom had, uh, when she was young, she had to stay home and look after the family. She was the oldest in the family. So that brought on the nurturing thing, I'm sure. Uh, were you close to your mother when you were growing up? Uh, <laughs> at times. What time? I, the only thing I can say is uh, she had her thoughts about what I had to do and I had my thoughts what I had to do. Uh, the only thing I wouldn't do for her was scrub the floor. She could have probably beat me to death. I wouldn't have still scrubbed the floor. <laughs> Just wasn't a man's job. So was there a real gender division of labor when you were growing up? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Did your dad ever help with any of the housework? No, I never saw. Well, I saw my dad on occasion wash dishes once in a while. But it had to be a rare occasion. So when you were growing up, what types of things would you do with your mother? Other than bug her. <laughs> or bugging her. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, she always got bugged a bit. We never had too many games we played together with uh, things like that with our parents. It just wasn't... Uh, in those days, it wasn't the way it is today. They had their, they had their image to uh, leave, and it wasn't easy to break that. I don't say that we didn't do anything together, but nothing spectacular, you know, outside of go picking uh, Saskatoons or uh, go to the fair, you know, and that we were only able to do if we got the. Uh, potato bugs picked. If there were potato bugs or weeds to pull, we had to have that done before we could go to the exhibition, so. Potato bugs? What? Well, they're the beetles that get on your potatoes and, uh, and want to eat the leaves off. You see, we still have them here. I don't know, if you never see them down there? I haven't been around a lot of potato, growing up potatoes. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I've never tried it, so. Yeah. Yeah, well, we we just got into growing a few more than we usually do. I started a little market gardening now, so trying to see if uh, there's more in it than in farming. So, when you were growing up, did your mom have a fairly large garden? Yeah, she always had a pretty large garden, yeah. My dad, actually, my dad was a gardener. Well, my mom gardened too, but my dad... Uh, Finally took over the garden. He was uh, actually the gardener at the end. He loved the garden, and he made a he made a he had a good garden. We had all the water we needed, and I can remember him just running the water through a two-inch pipe into the garden and letting it uh, into trenches and soaking it. That you had to have rubber boots up to there. You walked in there; it was so soft that it never lacked for water. So what type of vegetables would your dad and mom grow in their garden? 
pretty well everything, uh, except for melons. They never grew melons, but uh, cucumbers, potatoes, corn, beets, cabbage, beans, peas, carrots, radishes, you name it. He always tried to get the or He always was a little bit in uh, selling uh, potatoes. He tried to get the early market on the potatoes and get them early so that the people could get some early potatoes, and he always got a good market for it. Eh? So that uh, I kind of leaned toward him that way. Uh, it took me a long time to see that maybe that was the right thing to do, but I wish I'd have thought of it when I was 50 years old instead of 75. But there's another generation. Large garden, did your parents do a lot of canning? Well, did you ever help with that? No, nope. I helped with picking the vegetables, but I still can't can to this day. That's my wife's job. Um, when you think back to your childhood, um, can you tell, can you describe your parents' marriage? How did they work together? Uh, they worked. They worked together. Uh, my mom helped out in the yard lots, despite that my dad didn't wasn't a very good housekeeper. But they had their ups and downs. I think a lot of it. Uh, when you think back uh, now that I've grown up, I think a lot of it stemmed back to uh, poverty. Not poverty, but the lack of a lot of funds and. Uh, having to survive uh, through the 30s and the hard times and all that. And, and when they, uh, through the 30s when things were so tough, we didn't have hospitalization at that time. And uh, I think if I'm right, all but I and my brother ended up in the hospital. And uh, the money was short and he couldn't pay the hospital bills so they kept mounting up. and compound interest and he damn near lost the farm through uh, hospital bills. So how did people end up in the hospital? They had an epidemic of uh, smallpox or was it scarlet fever? I'm not sure which one that came through. And there was a lot of people in the hospital at that time. God help me if we had an epidemic like that here today. So when they would go to the hospital, was that in Regina? or? Yeah. How many children did your parents have? My parents? Mm -hmm. uh, nine, eight, eight. Uh, one died, uh, a teenager. We had eight survived. Who died when they were a teenager? Catherine. How did Catherine die? They call it double pneumonia, which I could never understand. It had to be pneumonia along with some other, other uh, illness. Did you get to know her? No. No, I didn't. Can you take me um, from the oldest to the youngest for, for your brothers and sisters? Well, there's Anne, Chris, and then some, well, the first oldest was Katie, Anne, Chris, Al Alec, Emma, myself. Celia and Clara, just Jerry, that was the last one. I knew there's eight, now I missed one, that's right. So what year did um, Catherine die? Do you know? Was it before you were born or? Oh no, I was uh, probably in 34, no. She passed before that because she wasn't over there anymore. It had to be 30, 31, 32. Just shortly after I was born, I'd say. Because okay. I never got to know her. And I can remember back when I was four years old. So it was before that. And that's anywhere before 35. Can you tell me a little bit about your oldest sister, Anne? What type of a person was she when you were growing up? 
she was good. She was a, she was a, she was very good. I got along real well with her. We still get along real well. She's still alive. She's uh, 84. So she's nine years older than you? Yeah, at least. And uh, she was always, always the mediator. She always was the one that made peace. Sometimes at her expense. As I told you, my dad wasn't very understanding sometimes. Did Anne have to help out a lot around the house with your mom? She helped out in the house and in the outside as well. And what about Chris? What type of a Oh, she she helped out more. She was all right. She she would if she were here, she'd remind you that she looked after me for a whole year when I was sick. So when I was a baby, that's what it was when I was a baby. She stayed home from school for a whole year to help mom look after me. Really. So she probably um, grew closer to me than I did to her. <laughs> oh, she's okay. I don't. I just say that for fun. Older brother? Yeah. What type of a brother was he? He was full of mischief. He was always teasing the girls and getting away with what he could. And a lot of times he did what he what he should have, but he was always accused of not doing it. You know, if he had something to do and Dad told him to do something, didn't always believe him because he was hard to believe. He was a kind of a uh, con artist, eh? He's passed away now. He's. Uh, I better watch what I say because he'll haunt me tonight. <laughs> were you close to him when you were a kid? Yeah, he was my big brother, and yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Um. Before we end, or the last time we ended with talking a little bit about your brother Alec. Um, and you mentioned that he was uh, kind of a mischievous older brother. Did you ever get into any mischief with him? Ah, uh, oh, he led me into some things, yeah. I can't specifically think of nothing uh, that was really that bad that I did with him, although I tagged along on certain occasions when he kept making trouble for our sisters. Like he'd uh, chase him with a broom or anything he got a hold of, a stick or, and of course he could never catch me, it was just like a piece of wire, you know. But, uh, yeah, I got into, one time when he came home from high school, I can remember, uh, it was a very dry year and we were stacking Russian thistle. And uh, you know what Russian thistles are. Mm -hmm. And we stack them one year to feed our cattle for the winter. Why, I don't know. There's no food value in them, but we did anyhow. And uh, he had just come home from high school and had learned how to smoke up there. So here we were on a stack of dry Russian thistles smoking. Can you imagine the, if that match would have gone on the Russian thistle, we wouldn't be doing this interview, that's for sure. That was one of the things that he got me involved in. Another thing that he tried to get me involved in was uh, when I was in high school. Uh, I don't know if all, uh, all kids go through this or not, but uh, you go into a store and you kind of dare yourself to take something, you know. it's. Uh, it's just, it's not that you want it, but you just want to see if you can get away with it. And we had a lot of guys, uh, we used to go down by 40, 50 of us from, we had a store they called the Army Navy downtown, which was a, a catch-all store. They had everything in there, different things that interested you. And we had one guy come out of there with a whole line of equipment for baseball, a bat, a ball, and a glove, and a pair of cleats. And, uh, I wasn't quite that bad. I stopped at a counter where they had sunglasses, 
and I took a pair of sunglasses. Now, this is the first confession I made of that. And I took them home. My brother saw these sunglasses, and I told him where I got them. Oh, he says, you could take them, he says, and I could sell them. Eh? He's always a thinker. He always was conniving. Those are the two of the things I can uh, think of the best. Uh, never anything that stood out, but always something that made him uh, foremost among the kids. Eh? How about your sister, your sister Emma? What was she like? Well, she's the next sister to me, and uh, she was a. Uh, Uh, she was uh, more laid back a little more than the other girls, and uh, she liked art. In fact, even today, yet she draws and she paints. And, uh, we played a lot of games together, tag and uh, and what have you, and uh, with like kids. And, she always was sure I wouldn't get in trouble. Do you remember any of the other games that you used to play with when, with Emma, besides tag? Run, sheep, run. Fox and goose in the winter time. I don't know if you ever heard of that game, but fox and goose is a game where you tread out a circle in the snow and you make it like a cake. You cut lines across and you have a, a home free area in the middle of the of the circle, a big round circle. And then you chase the person around the square and if he got to, around the circle and if he got to the middle first, well he was free. So he got a point, eh? We played a lot of that. Would you play that at school or on the farm? In the farm or school was, yeah. Or we had a game we called Duck in the Rock. You uh, had a big stone, you laid another stone on top of it, and you threw a stone at it. You try to get the stone off the top of the stone. Oh boy, that was quite a game. It taught you how to aim pretty straight. You could. Where would you get these stones from? Oh, there was no shortage of stones in our country. Never any shortage of stones. We still have them even today. And who was the the next sibling that was younger than you? That was my sister, Sil. Sil? Cecilia, yeah. Cecilia, okay. What was she like? She was uh, she was more a loner. She she's uh, closer to me now than she was when I was a, when she was my well. She was quite a bit younger than I. But uh, I never really got to know her that well because I went away to school and she was still only eight or ten years old, nine years old or something. But, uh, yeah, she was okay. And then was, there's two more after her? Clara. And what was, do you remember anything about Clara from when you were a kid? Well... I can remember we, uh, like her, my Syl and Clara and I, we were all made to take uh, organ lessons. So I can remember that. So we were involved with that. And, uh, I don't really have any stories with Clara that much. They, uh, her and Syl were mostly together and playing together more than uh, I was more with the neighbors boys. They come down and we'd play something else, eh? And my younger brother, he, uh, Jerry, he, uh, he was only uh, seven years old when I went to high school. And uh, he was close to me. We, uh, he'd go every place that I went if he could, I was able to get there somehow or other. I took him along with me once on this, uh, I talked about this harrow thing. I took him and sat him on that, my dad was picking the rocks in the same field and I sat him on his hitch with me. Uh, we had broke some new land and he wanted to go along. So I sat him on the hitch, everything was going fine until a harrow came and hit him and knocked him down and 
and he ended up underneath the, uh, the reach uh, where the harrows are on. He was doubled up under there, and he, he survived. My dad come on. Uh, he was lucky he wasn't killed. That was the last ride he ever got. Uh, you mentioned that you would play often with the neighbor boys. How far, how close were your closest neighbors? Oh, about a half a mile. They were cousins of mine. Go down there lots of nights and uh, lie in front of the radio, and uh, especially Saturday night, lie in front of the radio and uh, listen to the Toronto Maple Leafs play hockey. Old Foster Hewitt be broadcasting, and they had a nice big radio, so you could go down, you could listen together. We both uh, liked the same team, so it wasn't hard, you know. So. Would you have any snacks while you were, were over no. there soon to the hockey? No, well, you, sometimes you got a candy or something, but they, they didn't make a habit of, of feeding you a lot of things. They, okay. they just didn't, in those days, they didn't do that, not that much, eh? Except for the grandparents, they always fed you. Maybe they were trying to tell me something to stay at home, eh? If you're hungry. <laughs> uh. So did you have a radio at home? Yeah, but uh, in those days you ran them with a battery. Now, why, why they had uh, more batteries than we did, I don't know. Because my dad had a wind charger and he'd charge up his own batteries. and use them on the radio, but he, for some reason he always ran out of batteries. So as a result, he kind of rationed the time that he had the radio on. It was more for the news or anything like that, because the ra uh, batteries wouldn't last that long. Do you remember any other programmings that, programs that you would listen to on the radio when you were a kid? Oh, yeah, there was... Uh, there were some, they call them soap operas today, but in those days there were uh, Pepper Young's Family or uh, Shafter was one where the guy would always come and he'd flop in the Chesterfield or whatever. It was kind of a comedy show. Amos and Andy, of course, old standbys, and Jack Benny. You know, we had all those old... Uh, you could form your own, you had your own TV in your head, you know, you could pretty well visualize what they did as they went along. You had more imagination than enough those days. So, tell me what it was like in your house growing up with that many children. What type of house did you have? And where? We actually had a four-room house. And in the wintertime, we had a three-room house. It was an old house that was not insulated. It had uh, plaster inside and, uh, and boards and siding on the outside. Why well, I say three rooms in the wintertime because the kitchen was so cold we closed it off. It, the water would freeze in the wash basin. We had one stove which was a central pot belly stove and uh, upstairs was where all the kids slept. And, in two rooms, so you had uh, you had four in one room and uh, and uh, three in the other. It didn't matter what gender you were. I and my sister and brother slept together, and then four sisters slept in the other room. Well, the other one wasn't born yet when we were in that house, and uh, it was very cold up there. You had feather ticks, and you got under there, and you were just nice and warm, just like toast. My folks uh, slept downstairs in a bed, which was the dining room or living room or whatever you want to call it, and served as a kitchen as well. And they had their bed beside the stove, so they were always warm. Eh? And uh, so in the morning, you'd come down. I came down, I remember, one morning butt naked and heading for that stove. I was freezing when I got out of bed, dragged my clothes with me, and, and the others came right behind, and my brother, somehow or other, he gave me a push and I went right up against that stove. I'll never forget that. Right with the butt end. So that's one thing I remember about him. Uh, pardon me, but I just remember that. <laughs> so what would you use to, to burn in the stove for heat, to heat the house? Uh, coal. Coal, or if you didn't have coal, you'd get wood. Where would you get coal from? 
It was brought in by rail, and we'd get it out of a boxcar at uh, five miles away at uh, town. It was all out of Alberta. And uh, the lighting in the house, it was a cola lamp. I can remember just vaguely the candle, but the coil oil lamp was uh, just a lamp with a with a lampshade on. And you'd sit around that, and uh, you couldn't get within four feet if you want to read anything. It's pretty dim, eh? So no electricity. Electricity only came into our area in 1953. That's when we moved back out to the farm, and that's when they put the power in. Thank God. So it was all uh, pretty well uh, uh, old, uh, old uh, lifestyle until 1953, pretty well. And you know, had different, better houses, but you never had electricity, eh? And no running water. So how far was the well from your house? Ah, uh, about 100 feet. Did you have to haul the water? Yeah. I was elected for most part to get the water. How often would you have to haul in water? Uh, well, it wasn't that bad because we had a cistern, uh, a storage uh, vat downstairs made out of concrete about eight by eight. And we would gather rainwater and uh, in the winter sometimes we'd put ice in there to melt. And uh, it wasn't that bad. It's uh, a pailful a day maybe. It wasn't that big a deal, but uh, I remember my dad, we were out of water one night, it was getting dark outside and I didn't want to go. And he said, you go get a pail of water, in more words than that, but of course I went, and but on the way out I went a little bit like that, you know. Wasn't very happy with the thought, and he saw it, he, he, he gave me a bit of uh, what for when I got in with the pail of water? Uh, um, you mentioned that you would sleep three or four to a room. Did you have your own beds or? No. The girls uh, that were in the one room were two to a bed. And in the room I had my brother and I and my sister, I was uh, elected to lay in the middle. I was sandwiched in between because I was the youngest. But it kept you warmer though. Oh yeah, I was okay. But it was crowded from each side. So, what about meal times? What were those like in your house with that many children? Did everybody eat together? Or? Oh yeah, it was well organized. You said your prayers before your meal, and you said them after your meal, and you and you didn't leave the table until it was time to leave, until you had your food eaten. Did you have to clean everything off your plate? Yes, pretty well. They pretty well told you what to eat. They dished it out for you, and then you, you know, uh, this is good for you, and that's good for you, so you better eat it. Um, was, did you, everybody have their specific spots at the table? Or? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, we sat on what they called a bench. We had a bench behind the table, and... Uh, Instead of all chairs, there were some kitchen chairs, and uh, then we had a bench that we sat on. Four of us sat on the bench. Of course, everybody wanted to sit on the end, but that didn't work. So you pretty soon uh, found out where your place was in the line. You said you would say a prayer before and after dinner. Do you remember what, the, what prayer you would say? Yeah, bless us, O Lord, and these are gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Would you say that in German, though, when you were growing up, or was that in English? No, it was English. Okay. I can't remember what we said when we were kids. Probably uh, just one of the ordinary prayers in German. Was your mom a good cook? A uh, pretty good cook, yeah. Yeah. What were some of the good meals that she would make you? Uh, roast beef. Uh, she had uh, progies. I can remember her uh, her beef noodle soup, 
apple pie, noodle soup and apple pie every Sunday for our dinner. That was a Sunday dinner. And then we had, uh, I don't know if it's a Russian, if it's Russian or not, but she used to bake bread. And before she put all the bread into loaves, she'd uh, she'd make some, uh, if you will, uh, I'll call them for all intents and purposes. Uh, in German, they're called Schmutzkegel, which means a a lard cookie, if I translate it. But it's more like it looks like a pancake. You stretch out the dough and you make it like a big pancake, and you put it into the pan and you fry it. It's really, we still make it. My wife makes it now when we make bread yet. And she eats it with salt on, and I got used to eating it with sugar. You put sugar on, you roll it up, and, and you have, uh, if I can get good potato soup, that's what I like with it, and that's what my mother used to make with it, or else good homemade tomato soup. Works good together. So when you were growing up, did your mom make tomato soup? Yeah. Was it what we think of today as tomato soup, where it's creamy, or was it more of a vegetable? Oh, it's creamy. It's made with milk in it, and uh, it was made with milk. My wife could tell you the recipe better than I can. It was pretty well what my mom made. So what were some of the foods that your mom would make that you didn't enjoy? Uh, spinach, broccoli, turnips. Are you going to list every vegetable? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really like carrots or peas that much when I was young, but I, I've learned to, I like them now. I like even turnips. But you developed a taste for food after you get older that you didn't have when you were a kid. For some reason it happens for most people, I guess. Um, how about desserts? What were some of the desserts that your mom would make when you were a kid? Uh, did you make pudding, rice pudding, or tapioca pudding? Uh, jelly. Saskatoon and uh, rhubarb fruit. Uh, apple pie. All kinds of pies, actually. Cookies, any different kinds of cookies. Pretty well what you get today, much the same, not much difference in uh, your desserts, what you have today is what we had then. So when you were growing up, what type of chores were you responsible for around the, the, the house and the farm? Well, they varied, all depends what had to be done, I guess. But one of the things I knew was my chore was bringing in the wood. That was a nightly thing. We had to have it because our stoves were fired with wood, our cook stoves. Take out the ashes. Every Saturday we'd have to churn butter in a big uh, butter churn that was like a great big, you could put five gallons of cream into it and, uh, and uh, turn it and pedal with your foot. It was like a big barrel that went back and forth like that. And then you'd, uh, you'd do that and you'd learn your catechism at the same time. That was uh, one way to keep you from swearing, I guess. Uh, another thing, uh, with this wood, it, uh, it got, you had a whole lot of wood, so I became a little, little ingenious about that. I had a calf that I taught how to drive, how to, how to pull my sleigh. <clears throat> I made a harness for it and loaded up the sleigh with the wood, and I drove the sleigh to the house with the calf. That saved me a lot of work. Uh, what else did I do? Water, feed the chickens, milk cows. That was a nightly chore, slop the pigs. Clean barn. Of course, that all goes with it. Often would you have to clean the barn? Oh, probably every third day. In the summer and every winter, once a day. And you had a whole 
all feed by hand and put it up in the loft and pitch it off with a fork. One guy was on the rack, he'd pitch it up, and the other guy was up in the hole, and he'd stack it up inside the loft. You know, he tried to get up enough for a week or two, uh, at least, uh, so he didn't have to go out if it storms or something like that. There was numerous things you had to do. When you were growing up, did your dad have a tractor on the farm? He got his first tractor when he was probably 13, 14 years old. That's one of our grandsons. And it was an old, uh, they called it a hard part. It was a two-piston affair, a big uh, clumsy thing that probably had 70 horsepower. And it was on steel. And it couldn't pull any more hardly than eight horses. It, uh, we were better off probably with the horses. But it was so clumsy you'd get to the end of the field and you had to start turning when, uh, when you were from here out to the street. When you got to the end to make it around the corner, there were no wheel brakes. You just had to turn and turn and turn. And when you were halfway around, you started winding the other way to get it back on track again. So you know you didn't go through the short way. You, you always went through the half mile. So you didn't have to turn so damn much, eh? <clears throat> and then we progressed up from there. And now today we have four tractors on the farm. We haven't got a big farm, but we still have enough machinery to... Get the job done. Um, let's talk a little bit about grade school. You mentioned um, that you went to a country school for grades 1 through 8. 1 through 10. 1 through 10. You did the 9, nine and 10 through correspondence at yep. the school? Yeah, at the school. Okay. Where was the country school located? We were fortunate. Our, uh, our farm was... Uh, I just had to go about uh, a thousand, uh, thousand yards. No, not a thousand yards, a thousand, well, not even a quarter of a mile. Just across, uh, across uh, the highway and uh, right across the corner. It was very close. I was fortunate in a way, but at dinner time, of course, I'd go home for lunch and then I had all these chores to do, eh? Feed the chickens and slop the pigs and whatever. And, uh, the other guys were having a good time at school. But it was good. I, I enjoyed being that close to school. I didn't uh, really begrudge them having to drive two, three miles with their horses to school. But we only had one teacher. The entire time you were there? One teacher for all the grades. But uh, And the teachers uh, never, to my knowledge, maybe the longest one teacher stayed... Uh, was two years. You'd have a new teacher, sometimes two teachers a year. How they ever got it done, I don't know. And uh, they weren't paid a heck of a salary. I got uh, the books from that school that was uh, open at that time. And uh, somehow or other, $500 a year sticks out in my mind for some teachers. Do you remember what the school number was? 174, Fairview. There was many as uh, 28 that I can recall kids in that school. A one room school. And never noisy. On occasion, maybe, but that didn't last very long. What subjects were taught in school at that time? Reading, writing, arithmetic, science. Uh, pretty well all they teach today in uh, public school. Do you remember what um, type of school supplies you needed for school? A uh, pencil, eraser. Uh, scribbler, they called it. The old scribbler, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they had uh, they had the multiplication table on the back of them and the addition table. 
that was pretty handy when you were young. You didn't know your, you didn't have a calculator, so you just went to the back of the book, eh? But you learned all the multiplication that you can do right now in the top of your head without a calculator, eh? <clears throat> and ruler. Ah, some guys were lucky they had a pencil box they could stick everything in. So when you would walk into a, this school, how would how was it set up? What did it look like inside? Well, you'd come in the door, which was on one corner. Well, you first come into the front hall, which had a bunch of uh, hangers to hang up your coats and things on the wall, like uh, hooks. Then you had the water cooler in the one corner for your water. Then you'd go in the door on the corner, and you'd come in, there was all your desks in rows. Probably six rows of desks, and then you went from the low grade to the high grade. And the teacher's desk was up in the front. How did the teacher um, instruct students with having eight, eight to ten grades in one classroom? That's a real good question. She had to be very creative. She'd get you going on, uh, she'd get one grade going on uh, an assignment, I suppose, you know, get them to do something in math. And then she'd progress over to a, another grade and get them going on something else and come back and back and forth like that. She managed real well. She did a good job. I don't say teachers today don't do a good job, but can you imagine having 10 grades to? So the last two grades you said you did by correspondence. Well, how, do you, how would you do that? What was that? Well, you had to, uh, there was, uh, what did I forget, was it 12 sections to that correspondence to each uh, subject? And you had to get them done in a certain length of time, and you'd send them into the Department of Education to get them corrected. They were all instrumented by the Department of Education, but you had uh, your teacher was there only to help you if she could. Otherwise, you had to do your research, which was a good thing. You learned how to research out of a out of a textbook instead of getting all the information off the internet or whatever. So. To be a teacher, how much education did you have to have? They had to have a grade 12, and then they went to what they called a normal school. I think they went uh, two years to normal school, maybe three. Then they went out practice teaching for uh, a few, uh, maybe six weeks before they got to be a full-fledged teacher. They called those... Uh, Normal lights, the, the ones that weren't teachers but were just going to be graduating to be teachers. They'd come out uh, in the spring of the year and they'd be there just before exams and then uh, they'd uh, take over the classroom for six weeks. They used to send, I think it was two, instead of having one. Did that ever happen at your school? Oh yeah, all the time. Every year. What did the kids think about that? When oh, they loved it. They loved it. Yeah, they were. They looked forward to them coming because they always had a. Not quite as disciplinary for one thing. And they had a fresh outlook. They different uh, slant on things. When you were attending the country school, if a child misbehaved, how were they disciplined? There was only one way. You get out the belt. It was about two feet long, a half an inch uh, thick, and about two inches or three inches wide. And after five or six of those on each hand, you knew darn well that you better try better next time. It sure beats riddling all the heck. So let's talk a little bit um, about religion, because it sounds like that was something that was very uh, prevalent in your mm -hmm. childhood. 
How often did the family go to church? Uh, every Sunday. We were five miles from church. And when my dad grew up, he went every day because he lived in the colony. They had mass every day. We got to go, we, we did go uh, once or a few times in between if there were special days or whatever, but for the most part, Sunday at 10. Well, actually 9.30 because we had a half an hour of instruction before mass. <clears throat> and then we didn't get out. Uh, we had from 10 till, usually it was 12, 30, 1 o'clock until the priest released us. We had just about two, three hours in church every Sunday. If he got up in the pulpit, he would hammer the pulpit and he would be going at her there in German. What church did you attend? St. Peter's in, uh, in the colony. That's the one that has um, the, the paintings? paintings? Yeah. yeah. Who was uh, the priest when you were growing up? Father Metzger. What type of a, a father was he? He wasn't a father. He was a priest. <laughs> what type of a priest was he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was very strict. Very, very old-fashioned. He had... He was hard to get close to. He had only maybe one or two close friends, like married folks, say. Eh? My uncle and his uh, wife were two that were close to him and he was different when he could socialize with someone like that but he, he was very strict he was very disciplinary very old school which they a lot of them were in those days I understand <clears throat> how did he uh, interact with the children the youth of the church he demanded respect that's about uh, the full amount of it he never really did uh, interact with the children too much. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't a children person. He was there for one thing only. It was to get you to heaven. He figured. There's an easier way to heaven, though. I think than than bouncing you over the road. If you didn't know your religion, God help you. You'd have to uh, kneel all through the mass besides being pulled up there by the ear. You know, now that he was quite disciplinary, right? So when you were, uh, you went to St. Peter's, were you baptized there? Yeah. How about your first communion? Did you take that? Took that there. Do you remember your first communion? Uh, not really. Not really. Did you go through confirmation yeah. at St. Peter's? Do you remember that? It isn't, it isn't uh, really that uh, important a time. Uh, like, it doesn't stand out in my memory. I know there was a lot of us that went at the same time. And uh, I can remember the Archbishop with his rod and asking questions and you sit in the chair Hoping the hell he wouldn't ask you. Did he ask you a question? I'm not sure anymore, but I was hoping he wouldn't. I can tell you that much. Because you weren't sure what he would ask you. And if you know it, you didn't get confirmed eh, in those days. He didn't slide by you and said, do you know the question? You can't go. And that was uh, a black black mark. eh? So I got confirmed. So maybe he did ask me a question and I answered right. <laughs> Clothes would you wear to church? Suit and white shirt and tie. No blue jeans weren't allowed. And in those t days too, uh, in the modern churches today, they have uh, a lot of different instruments that they can use. They have, even have such a thing as a polka mass, which uh, they play a jazzy type of of mass and uh, and the people just all but get up and dance. Uh, in those days, the only uh, really accepted instrument in the church was the organ. And I understand the harp was another one that you could have had in the church, but they were the two that were uh, the only ones that uh, 
were acceptable in the church at that time. Were the services in German or? The service itself was in Latin. The sermon was in German, but the service was in Latin. It was, uh, it was very, uh, I wouldn't say, it was very kind of boring, you know, the Mass itself, except the singing was, we all sang in the choir, and uh, we used to sing in harmony, and that was a high point of the Mass. A lot of these Masses had, uh, they were very well written. And uh, sometimes, even today, I think back on to how the harmony was. It was, uh, it would make goosebumps, actually. So, um, speaking of singing, did you want to sing for us today, or? Well, I don't know if my teeth will let me. Honestly, God, I'm not, okay. uh, they want to fall out sometimes if I go to get that carried away. Fine. Do you remember any? Um, the names of some of the German, German songs that you would sing as a child? Yeah, Du liegst mir im Herzen. Ich habe ein Kummerrad. At New Year's we'd sing Ein Glück seliges neues Jahr, which means uh, one happy new year. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. I, there's a lot of songs we sang, but they don't come into the head that fast, eh? Would you sing these at home, or would they be...? Especially at a dance, or a party, or a wedding, or... Especially weddings. The old people would get together, you know, you'd get 40, 50 of them together singing. And the young guys would try to grab a hold of the words. Uh, they never did teach us songs, but we did learn some of them, you know? And uh, well, before they all passed away, I, there was about five of them left, and I says, I says to them, I says, you know, I'll never forgive you for not teaching us these German songs. I said to them, oh, no, but now our kids don't know any German songs. So, shame on me. Would, were, these German, was, were some of the German songs also sung at funerals? Not really. They sang uh, somber uh, requiem mass at the funeral, and after the funeral, it wasn't the same as it is today. The people uh, take a different outlook uh, on a funeral than they did at that time today. They look at it more as a joyous event, as, uh, as that, uh, sure, you're sad of losing a person, but you're also joyful that they're, you know, that they're, Especially if they've been suffering. You mentioned weddings. Can you tell me uh, what a wedding was like when you were growing up? Oh, they were very, uh, very social. They were very social. They weren't quite like they were in the days when my dad was young. When my dad was young, the, the weddings would last for three days. And they had them in a big greenery. Well, we had them in a the hall. We weren't quite that. We were a little more sophisticated. But they lasted all night into the next day. And uh, our particular wedding, I remember real well because it was our wedding, I guess. We had mass at 10 o'clock in the morning, which lasted till 11 at least or a little longer. Then we went and to the hall. And we'd have a full dinner, sit-down dinner for everybody. There was probably 150, 200 people there. And uh, after dinner, we danced what they called a bride dance. And uh, the uh, people in the tens would come, and one man would take my wife, and the other one, the lady, would take me. And every time they danced with us, they'd put some money into the, into the hat, eh? And then they'd get a drink, and of course you had to take a drink, you know. So that was from one o'clock. That lasted till four thirty or so. So you can imagine the da the dance, uh, the one round of dancing didn't last for two minutes, three minutes, maybe four. The next guy come up, you have another slice, eh? 
Then uh, before uh, before uh, supper, I was my wife wouldn't take a drink very much, eh? But I had one every time because uh, it was expected of me. I'm the man, eh? Of course, till uh, and he wanted to, us to go back to church at uh, prior to supper for benediction. He called it a eh? blessing. Well, I went, but I didn't last. I went out of church and I left my wife in church by herself. I had to go otherwheres. <laughs> then after that was over. I was fine. Went and had supper and danced again all night and had some more liquor, eh? You're still full of spit and vinegar when you're young, 23 years old, what the heck, eh? So were you drinking what they what they called homebrew, or...? No, it was all bought liquor. Okay. No, we uh, we were to some homebrew weddings, I tell you. They were, they were okay. Where they had a big tub on the one end of the hall and a dipper on each side. You just dipped out whatever you wanted, all night if you wanted, whatever. Never run out. You never get drunk, though. I went and I didn't feel good till I, about 11 o'clock, went and uh, just sat down and left for a while and come back and I was fine. You never get drunk. So how did you meet your wife? It was at a dance. I kind of knew that she was my, uh, that she was Pete's uh, cousin, I guess, uh, maybe he introduced us, I even forget, but I know it was at a Valentine's dance, and uh, the dating started not long after that. What were the dances like when you were a, a young kid? Ah, they were quite lively. Liquor wasn't allowed. You didn't have such a thing as a cabaret. But you'd take your liquor anyhow and you'd have it out in the car or whatever. And you'd hide it wherever you could. On one occasion we hid it in a graveyard because we know darn well the cops wouldn't come there. Another guy, he got a little bit, uh, he got an idea, he'd uh, hide it from everybody, put it under the wheel of his back tire because the cops were in town. And he took a girl out to the car for a drink, and he forgot he had the bottle under there, and he drove, <laughs> drove over it. <laughs> oh boy! Uh, or else you'd buy a gallon of port wine. I think it was about two dollars, a dollar and a half for a gallon, six or eighty guys, and you'd have a, you'd have port wine for for the night. Or if you wanted to go further than that, you could find a bootlegger and he'd sell it to you. You'd pay about four times the money for a, put it into a jar. Well, let's, um, I'll ask a few uh, concluding questions on your childhood. Sure. Um, when you think back, what is one of the most adventurous childhood memories that you have? In what age? Um, anywhere before you got married. Oh. I, I can't think of one that sticks out very. I had a lot of good uh, memories, but uh, one that really sticks out is hard to... Hmm. Boy, that's a tough one. I wish I'd known this question was coming. I'd have thought about it. <laughs> uh. Well, we could try a different one. Let's see here. How about a scary time? A time when you felt a little uneasy or, or scared. Oh, there were lots of those. When I was a kid, I recall, I don't know if I dreamt it or thought of it, and I thought my mother and father had died, and that was, that was a scary thing, and I never forgot that for a long, long time. 
or else uh, the time that I was chased by a bull. My sister was with me that time and we were going out to the barn for something or other and uh, ended up getting away from the bull and trying to go up to into the loft and I fell down and the bull came and all he did was eat hay, thank God. Or with the rooster, like I told you before, that was a scary time. As I got older, I got wiser. But uh, one of the things that I did do when I grew up, there was a new family moved into the district. I don't know if this could be classified a good time or a scary time for somebody. But my cousin became my manager, and I had to fight three young guys every noon hour at noon at school. So I learned how to fight one at a time. I always won because I learned where to hit them. But after that came the scary time. They said enough is enough one day. They just uh, came with uh, sticks and stones and bats and oh, 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 let's be friends here. That was the end of the fighting. The manager quit. Some of the, or what is one of your happiest memories? Outside of meeting my wife, I, I got to put that number one. Oh, probably going to the, the beach to swim. So could you swim? Oh yeah. Well, I learned on my own. I could float better than I could swim. I couldn't swim over the top stroke. I always had a stroke underneath either the butterfly or else the dog paddle because uh, I couldn't get any water in my ears. I had trouble with my ears. and I could have put earplugs in but I thought of it. And then I could have learned how to swim. I had to learn how to swim because we had uh, water right there. We went in uh, water twice a day. about your childhood that we haven't talked about that you wanted to share with us today? I think you've covered it pretty well. I think you've done a good job. And then the last question is why did you want to participate in this project today? Uh, it's something different. Uh, Perhaps someday I can uh, see what the rest of the people that you have interviewed uh, have to say, you know, and uh, more inquisitive, I guess, and uh, see what, uh, what it was all about.